Now for our story. Tonight, in the scattered farmhouses around Wakefield and in the little town itself, there was a bustle of excitement. Young girls pinned flowers in their carefully arranged hair. Young men furiously polished their shoes, and mothers and fathers got into their best clothes. All this happy activity was in preparation for the grand opening of the supper club, which Lily Devon had been working so hard to get started, and for which Aunt Mary Lane had such high hopes as a place the local teenagers might consider their very own. Bill Mead had called for Peggy Douglas, his fiancée, and a brand new Ford sedan. He was wearing the same dark blue suit he'd had before he went into the Army, and although it was a little snug across the shoulders, Bill looked very handsome in it. And Peggy was waiting for him, lovely in a white dance frock with a long, full skirt. Now, as they get into the new car, Bill starts the motor. Listen, Peggy. Pretty smooth, isn't it? Oh, it sounds wonderful. Oh, boy, it's a relief to have a decent car again. Mm, listen to that purr. Oh, it sounds fine. Not that I know anything about the insides of a car. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess we better get started, huh? So we're a little early. Do you think Harry and Mary will be ready? No, they are. It won't matter. Hey, is Randy going into that Marion lecture? Uh huh. Or he's not taking a girl with him? No, I guess not. <laughs> well, he probably intends to spend most of his time with Lily anyway. Yeah, I suppose so. But I imagine she'll be pretty busy. She has to see that everything runs smoothly. And I believe she intends to entertain as well, so she'll have her hands pretty full. Yeah. Hey, I'm really looking forward to this evening, aren't you? Oh, you bet I am. We ought to have a swell time. Well, according to Lily, the place looks very nice. Oh, gosh, but I hope it'll be a big success. But Mary's had her heart set on this scheme for an awfully long time. Well, I don't see any reason why it shouldn't go over. <laughs> it certainly won't have any competition. There's nothing like it in town. Yeah, I know. Some of people get used to the idea of it. <laughs> I talked to Kyla on the phone today. Hmm? She was so excited about going. Yeah, I'll bet she was. Well, she told me this is the first dance she and Mary have been to since they were married. No. I'll be done. Well, you know how Mario's always been. He never wanted to go anywhere. At least not anywhere that meant people would be looking at Carla. Mm. No, but I think you and I can help those two a lot. What they need more than anything is friends. Real friends. Oh, sure they do. <laughs> it's a good thing Mario got over being mad. I hated the guys being sore at me. Especially when it was caused by a crazy gossip. <laughs> yeah. You know, I still can't figure out how a rumor like that got started. Neither can I. It's no use trying to understand it, Bill. Just one of those things that happens. Yeah, I guess so. Somebody makes an off-hand remark, not meaning anything particular about it. And then the next person repeats it and adds something of his own. Before you know it, there's a totally false story going around. Being repeated as gospel truth. Yeah. It's the best thing of not to pay any attention to it. Just let it die out by itself. And so far as Carl and Mario are concerned, we don't need to worry about that anymore. Oh, I sure hope not. Yeah, I like them. They're nice, simple, down-to-earth kids. Mm-hmm. We can have a lot of fun together, the four of us. Yes. And then as I think we can help them a lot, too. We take them around with us and get them acquainted with the people. I, I think that's what they need. Oh, tonight ought to be a good time to start. <laughs> I imagine everybody in town is old enough to walk or be there. Mm-hmm. That's people haven't talked about anything else all day. I know. And do well, let's try to keep an eye on Carl and Mario, shall we? I mean, to be sure they don't feel lonely or anything. <laughs> I know. Gosh, you're turning into quite a little fixer-up. <laughs> well, it's just that they may feel shy, being around so many strangers all at once. And as you say, everybody and his brother will be there tonight. Bill reached out and took one of Peggy's small hands in his. The two young people lapsed into a contented silence, happy in their love for each other, and in a useful satisfaction that they might be able to help others to find happiness, too. But at that same moment in the bedroom of his big house on 11th Street, Ben Calvert was preparing for the evening's affair. Ben, it was a threat to the happy future Bill and Peggy hoped for. Oh, confounded Jesse, a lot of foolishness, my climbing into dinner clothes for an affair like this. Now, Ben, don't be cross. After all, you're the most important man in this town. Someone has to carry on the traditions of civilization. Well, if there's anything civilized about a shirt that's stiff as a board, a collar that practically chokes you, and a hot, uncomfortable coat, I'd like to know what it is. <laughs> Stop complaining. You look very handsome. Yeah, I can imagine. Really, you do. You might return the compliment. What? Yes. You haven't even looked at me. Well, Jesse, you do look striking. 
<laughs> that dress that you have just read. Ben, this isn't what you call a dress. It's a gown. Well, what's the difference? You'll understand when you see the bill. Oh, well, it does your proud duty, whatever it does. I want it to be a credit to you, Ben. I thought we should let this town know we're not ashamed, that we're not afraid. Do you really like it? Well, it's very lovely, Jesse. Shoulders like a young girl. Smooth and so white. Yes, he is. Oh, be careful, Ben, my hair. You're very sweet, Ben, but I think we'd better get started, don't you? It's rather late. Very well, I, I suppose we must. But first, there's something I have to tell you. I've been postponing it, but I feel I can't any longer. No? What is it, Jesse? Let's go downstairs, Ben. Is you quite ready? I'm as ready as I'll ever be. Ben, I had a telephone call while you were away. It was from Paul Cromwell in Miami Beach. Cromwell? Yes. It seems that's where Kitty is right now. So, that's where she went. It's odd, though. Kit hasn't seen Cromwell since she was in New York several years ago. I wouldn't be too sure about that. I have a feeling they saw each other much more recently. But that doesn't matter now, then. Kit followed Paul to Miami. And the point is, according to him, she's in very bad shape. What? She's ill. Kit ill? Well, what's wrong with her? Did Cromwell say? Yes, then, he did. I don't know how much truth there is in it. And personally, I'm not inclined to question his story. He's rather a devious character from what I've heard of him. Oh, wouldn't you say so? Well, I've never been overly fond of him. But for heaven's sake, tell me, Jesse, if Kit's really ill, then... According to Paul, she's had a, well, what you might call a mental breakdown. Good heavens. I was afraid you'd be upset, then. That's why I rather hated to tell you. On the other hand, I didn't want you to think I'd withhold information about Kit. I mean, in case the story is true. Though, personally, I very much doubt it. It sounds to me as if Kit Miss Cromwell cooked up a scheme with the idea of getting Kit back in your good graces. She must have told him what happened. They both knew you were bound to be washed up with her, and that you had a right to be. Yes, Jesse, but that's just supposition on your part. It doesn't sound like Kit to fake illness like that, especially that sort of a news. Doesn't it, then? And yet six months ago, you would have said it didn't sound like Kit to take another woman's child and... Pawn him off to her father as his own grandson. Yes, and I certainly wouldn't have thought that of him. Well, there you are then. Kit demonstrated that she'll use every trick in the book to get what she wants from you. And she very nearly succeeded in hibbling you this last time. Now, having failed, she's simply trying a different tactic. Yes, I suppose you're right. If she'd pulled a stunt like that before, I wouldn't put anything past her now. She knows I'm angry. No doubt this Cromwell convinced her that if she pretended to be ill, I'd forgive her. Exactly. And you notice she didn't pretend to be physically ill. That's too easy to disprove. But anyone can pretend to be out of his head. And it's usually very hard to prove whether it's fake or genuine. Well, that's it. Just another kid's trick. Well, this is one time she'll not get by with it. She'll have to paddle her own canoe as best as she can. But Ben Talbot's daughter was gravely ill and very much in need of proper care. If Ben refuses to come to Kit's aid, what will happen to her? She's out of funds and without friends. Yes, Jesse, you long to see Kit banished from her father's house, cut off from the financial protection he can give her. And now at last, you have what you wanted. And yet, Jesse, Ben may change his mind when he thinks things over. <laughs> 